Welcome to the post work podcast recorded at Karmax Studios Bunker, somewhere hidden in Berlin. I'm Pablo Deneri, your host, and today's guest is a producer, DJ, and level owner, Thorsten Lutz. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me here, and I have to make a little correction because yeah. I'm not a producer. <laughs> ah, you're not a producer? No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a DJ and uh, I'm running a label. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I was a DJ. I mean, I was playing a lot of records in the past. Right. Um, but, uh, but I'm not because a... Stro it's, okay. It's Then I, I did a mis-research because something is under uh, st uh, stroboscope yeah, I, in uh, this course. This is right. I did, uh, I did, I think, let me think, I think two or three productions together with uh, Dr. Walker, okay. uh, with Ingmar Koch from Air Liquid, uh, long, 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 long time ago. Uh, but he was a man. He he did everything, and I was sitting next to him, and <laughs> and, and I was I don't know touching a, a pad sometimes. Because uh, since, since I saw this, of course I don't want to not call you producer. You know when you're a producer, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thorsten, um, I think um, in episodes like this, I would like to be a music historian in a way, because the things I would like to find out and ask you about have to do with something that. Um, I would like to have more specific educated reference for. But anyway, I have my own personal experience. And the truth is that um, to start somewhere, um, the truth is like in two thousand, early 2000s, um, when we were getting into electronic music and my crew, uh, we were into more experimental, not so traditional, dance music and so and we really had like um, a development of this taste that by the time in Argentina specifically in Buenos Aires is what was not so common mm -hmm. and but apart from developing the club culture our own club culture let's say we have these special moments after the club where we were um, we would uh, lay down and we were like in a very active perceptive Uh, state. You mean uh, after hour? After hour. <laughs> <laughs> but we would listen to not non-club music, but post-club music or post-rock music, in, specific, in particular uh, some albums from Karaoke Cult. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, <laughs> some from Kuchenmet's Map Station oh. or The Rock. Uh, or, okay, I see. Uh, to Rock or Call Road. And, For us, this was really, this was the special moment, you mm -hmm. know? And um, I have to say, it was music that include, it seemed to include a lot of the old and a lot of the new at the same time. Um, so I know it's a bit complicated, but I would like to uh, start asking, like, how do you think that this came to be, to make this kind of music? Um, well, um, I think... Um Uh, especially the time you mentioned around <clears throat> around 2000, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. I think, um, in my opinion, it was um, a fantastic time for electronic music. That means, um, for sure, everything starts uh, with a straight bass, with a straight bass drum. It starts with the club music. Uh, we we know house, we know techno. But um, on the other hand, uh, there were uh, a developed uh, electronic scene uh, which used uh, the maybe the, the tools from techno house. Uh, I mean, everything was electronic because okay, let me let me say it different. For example, there were a lot of people who played formal in bands. But right. they were super bored to play in bands because it was always discussion, always a lot of people, and you have to agree with everyone. And so, and most of them were really bored of it. And uh, still, so the traditional band format. Let's it's the traditionally band format, exactly. And then uh, they realized, okay, uh, I can buy uh, a sampler, I can buy a computer, and I can do everything by myself in my bedroom. And right. um, 
And I think this, this a, a lot of musicians did this uh, at this time, and um, and because of that, uh, suddenly we had an incredibly output of uh, music, of even new music. Most of the, most of the music was. Um, Produced on the computer with a sampler, with a code switch, by thousand, whatever. And uh, I remember that um, uh, at this time I, I lived in Cologne, and there was a record shop called Ar Musik. Ar Musik Plattenladen. Ar Musik Plattenladen, and it was a really small shop. It was really, really small shop, and I really loved to be there. And at this time, I was there. I, I think I think the shop was closed on Monday. I'm not sure yet, but I was there on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and <laughs> I, I was always waiting for the new stuff he ordered from the different distribution. And I remember that at this time I always find something new in a way that um, it wasn't techno, it wasn't house, but it was electronic. And it was super interesting, and it was for me at this time breathtaking. And I was buying tons of it. Right. And 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 this was, I think, uh, also influencing uh, the output um, of my label at this time. But um, uh, for me, it was uh, for the label Karo Kalk. I had uh, the luck that I was a uh, friend of, uh, for example, of Jörg Vollert. Jens Massel, uh, Jörg Vollert, he did the Wunder record. Uh, Jens Massel, um, Monikas are Zenking and Candice. And these two guys, uh, as I mentioned before, they were playing in bands and they were, they were bored of it and they start their own productions. And uh, they gave me the, the music and they said, um, What, what like should we side music for the time? Uh, yeah, what should we, what, what should we do with this? And and I was thinking, ah, let's make a label. So completely naive. I don't know what it means make a label, but um, <laughs> but I had a good uh, I had a good mentor. Uh, this guy was Wolfgang Vogt from Compact you know. because he was very experienced and uh, I learned a lot of him a, a lot from him about making uh, a record and uh, um, or running a label. And so I, I was completely, I had some money left and um, mm. the first record was from Candice. He gave me everything on that and I, I made, made an appointment at Da Plätze Mastering and with Robert Henke. And Exactly. And I, I, I went to Berlin and um, I go to the place of Mastering. I was like, I was a kid. And I was like, hey, OK, I was very <laughs> impressed. And, and so and I met Robert and he 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 mastered and he cuts the first recording. And um, yeah, and um, yeah, it was I don't know, it was very special and in a way also natural. <laughs> right. And no, but um, but I think uh, um, To, to come back to your question, yeah. I think it was a it was a really good time for for electro electronic music these hmm. days because um, you, you had a lot of new opportunities hmm. to to produce music and um, and there was so much crea creativity crea yeah. crea creativity creativity yeah. and um, and a kind of uh, renew freshness you know that absolutely. so far. The extension of uh, the post rock or the avant garde or the new waves. Um, until the end of the 90s, there haven't been this, at least at the popular music, commercial music level, this shift in what was accepted, accepted um, uh, aesthetic wise in the realm of the sounds of, um, for, for example, pop music. Mm -hmm. So you would start some music historians. Uh, talk about um, when the use of noise or glitch stopped to be something uh, to disrupt and to generate uh, um, uh, an anxiety feeling or a bad feeling to be like aesthetic beautiful element inside like a now uh, naturalized yeah. aesthetics you know yeah. so like what you would say new music in a way but as we were talking off camera when you were working for Viva <laughs> at the end of the 90s and how a lot of the music or most of the music would really, you could tell that it was not uh, generating this um, enthusiasm, you know? And But this 
suddenly switch in the mm -hmm. in the years to come. Um, there are some bands that you can trace this development. For example, I, I was in high school <laughs> and third year of high school with uh, mini disc, and I had a German band that is called the No Twist, mm -hmm. and um, kind of parallel development in static, let's say, with Radiohead, you mm -hmm. know, they also started very... Um, Super kind of independent. Rough, rough. And, and, you know, and in the end of the 90s, and so they really incorporated this um, machine uh, dream sound. And they were know? getting better and better, so... Yeah, and there definitely was something special, and for people that didn't found a rave club music, mm -hmm. let's say, rave dance music, emotional or profound because in a way it was the idea to make this texture and so for a lot of people this got them interested into electronic music you know this is right and this was the reason why um at these days uh in every good techno club uh or in every good club it don't have to be a techno club in every good club there was a so-called ambient room And uh, this is not existing anymore. But at, right. these, at these days, we had the ambient room. That's, and that's what I meant when I when I said when we started. You know, <laughs> this ambient moment yeah. for us was the next level, next dimension moment. But but sometimes it was because I remember that we were uh, um, with the label Karaoke Kalk. Sometimes we were invited to the to the big clubs, for example, Ultraschall oh. in Munich. Uh, it was a very famous club at these days, and they had the second room. This was a Flocati room, and there was always an ambient room. But uh, I remember that uh, sometimes this was also a little bit frustrating because <laughs> most of the time there were all the ravers coming, coming, coming up to us, and uh, and they fall into sleep. <laughs> there was de definitely a non-concordance there, and. This exists maybe until I, I remember when we started to come to Berlin, for example, for playing and so, and we wanted to continue this ritual, yeah. right? We we didn't find a place, I have to say. It's people, not were, people were really cutting us out and saying we wanted to cut the vibe, you know, and bring everything down. <laughs> and we were like, no, but this is like the next thing. <laughs> Um, there was always, in a way, this contradiction um, in what has to do with uh, club music or dance music and uh, genres of music with, with which it dialogues that are not necessarily share the origin story or myth that mm. uh, like um, uh, rave music has, yeah. for example. Yeah, or, yeah. You know? um, but exactly this is something very complex that... In this, in the music from your label, this seemed to finally get along all together. You know what I mean? All this, um, uh, in this way, it it was, I say, all of the old and all of the new in a way, but not fighting in a way or competing. But it, there was some new harmony. Um, in a way, but uh, I remember that uh, in the beginning when I started the label I was really, really into techno music and mm -hmm. really into house music and um, but the point was that I didn't, uh, I didn't know the producer, so I didn't start a house techno label. Mm -hmm. I only know the people uh, who um, yeah, who, who had a different music so social so socialization Yeah, socialization, socialization, yeah. and they're coming from from a completely different back uh, background, and um, so uh, and uh, f for me it was uh, when when I start the label, the only thing because my my uh, music uh, social so oh God, the word it's <laughs> very difficult so so socialization thank you, <laughs> was I was really into guitar music also into right. not rock but uh, but independent music and and every kind so so the typical yeah. kind of and for me it was very important in the beginning no guitars. It have to be electronic, right. so like this. I remember this. So, yeah. and or no vocals was also one of the. Yeah, <laughs> and but 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 this changed very quickly. So because then I realized um, it's completely stupid. <laughs> so you can do everything. I mean, you can release on your label everything you like, every right. every kind of music you like, and 
So I think it changed in, uh, at latest in 1999 when when I released uh, the first Donna uh, records from Donna Regina on yes. Karo Kakaik. So yeah. this was different. And um, mm. yeah, so. Yeah, it's, it was always this kind of cyclic process in a way, I think, when you have the um, uh, punk uh, movement, for example, uh, talking about music, and you have the post-punk, and you have things that were totally forbidden, you know, like incorporating um, uh, like electronic machines or making something that is melodic, you know, or that find this new beauty. It's, or, or incorporating the elements that were forbidden before started to be a sign of this new avant-garde, you mm -hmm. know? And um, so I find this, there's always this uh, cyclical dialogue with uh, what's happening in the underground, in a way, and how all genres in, um, uh, uh, relate to each other, you mm -hmm. know? You say you were into uh, rock, like indie music also. Yes. And I read somewhere that... Um, your first recollection of sound, in a way, was your parents' uh, Beatles collection. It was a Beatles, yeah. It was. Uh, they had it on tape, on cassette. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Nice. This, this, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was my. Um, I think this was really my first. Um, mu was kind of get in touch with music hmm. was uh, uh, the, the cassette Beatles collection of my, my parents. Yeah, that's right. And, and there's also another anecdote from your childhood that um, I think there's something in between these two experiences that might uh, have given some kind of um, context to all we are talking about in a way. Is this the Beatles contact, let's say? And it's also, uh, you told in an interview that you were six years old as a kid, you used to listen to radio for sleeping, and suddenly they played the robots from Kraftwerk, <laughs> and it woke you up, this metallic uh, uh, vocoder. Uh, Absolutely. It was like a shocking experience. I was so afraid. <laughs> <laughs> And I found that so uh, telling, you know, because these two, in between these two experiences, let's say the Beatles and the, the robots from Kraftwerk, <laughs> you can explain a lot of what or everything that happened music-wise, you know, for all the decades to come. Sure thing, but it was a question, I think, so, so, so the robot from Kraftwerk, I think it was released in 1982, or something, or 1981. It was very early. It's amazing so, early. Yeah, I time. think I was 10 years old or something, or 11. And um, I used to um, to switch on the radio mm -hmm. to, to before I go to bed, and I forgot to switch it off. And um, <laughs> and um, I remember that. And But, uh, yeah, it, it was really frightening. I watched it. I was oh, what the hell is this? And, uh, but I, I, I don't have any idea at this time or I wasn't even interested in what kind of music it is I was only surprised about it so I, I think it's very telling you know yeah. I, I was very happy to find this in the interview <laughs> because I, uh, you know I'm a sign of a psychoanalyst and I think I have a knack for for this kind of stuff and I'm sure this have must must have given you uh, some of this you know in between the um, the let's say harmonic uh, known uh, old maybe sound of the Beatles yeah. and that was very all around at that time um, or at least uh, the inheritance of it and the shock of the new sure the thing. shock of the new yeah, the I machine see. you know yeah. we are the robots uh, yeah but even it was uh, with the Beatles I mean it's still interested um, even to, even today it's at these days that um, I mean, how many people can sing the songs from the Beatles? The people know the lyrics, so it's really yeah. surprising me totally. It is, I, it's even I don't know, 60, 40, 50, 50 years later. So uh, even so. my son, he's already I don't know, he's nine years old now, and he knows he knows the Beatles, and um, he 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 knows most of the lyrics, and he can he can sing it, and this is this is really really interesting. It's it's, it's amazing, yeah, uh, totally. Um, even uh, I was uh, grew up anti rock music. 
I could afford it because we have already experimental electronics going around. Yeah. So I never really learned like uh, Argentinian rock mm -hmm. tradition or rock tradition in universal in general yeah. until uh, 20 something. How old are you? Uh, 36. 36? Oh, yeah. <laughs> But I had older friends. Uh, that we were making project with, also this totally new music, minimal, you know, separated from yeah. the... And they told me, w there will come a day that you will understand it also. And it happened. Yeah, it totally. totally happened. And in this, uh, even in this after-hour situation, you know, it was getting more uh, retro hippie. We, we used to call us techno hippies, you know, uh, at this time. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Sweet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and talking about this, uh, how something that culturally uh, looks or sounds so much different, you know, and maybe only in the underground or some uh, parts of society that wants to make a statement, you know, and something that makes noise, and uh, it ends up uh, being integrated in society somehow. And it reminds me, I saw a documentary from Kraftwerk. Um, I don't know which one of them it was that got one of the first MOOC modulars and a friend of uh, his was coming to the house and he says she remembers listening to uh, sounds out of this world, you know, yeah. it sounds from like uh, alien sound. Yeah, yeah. And when the, the wife of his opened the, the, the door, he, he, she's like, no, she just got, he just got the... The MOOC modular, you know, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> but yeah, but you, you, I think, I think Kraftwerk. I'm not sure yet, but but I think they were rich kids. I mean, they can't well, afford. Could to afford one of the first MOOC, you know. You uh, know, of course. Uh, and so this was uh, even unique. I mean, not not everybody. Uh, it's also a class uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Oh no, not a class thing. I don't know, but I think. No, it, it is. I mean, it's not a question of opinion. I mean, in access to technology. Yeah. It's because At technology time, is expensive. For sure. Uh, coming yeah. from a third world country or developing country, <laughs> yeah. we know how entangled it is. Everything that has that requires technology to yeah. do and the ability to afford it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's today. Today it's different. Today everyone. Today it's different. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, in in central countries is. Uh, is much different. Accessibility to technology yeah. is very common. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't at this time from the early tw uh, 2000s. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And yeah. when it suddenly was available, uh, I agree, uh, for many of us was a, a revolution. Yeah. Uh, an access and a new tool. Yeah. In my case, I was a frustrated piano uh, learner. <laughs> at 10, my parents said, Okay, we will not pay classes anymore because we don't practice. <laughs> you will never make music. And I remember when uh, 2002, I remember, I called my mother, she was living in Spain, and I was like, you, I, I got in uh, Ableton production or recent production classes. I called my mom and I was like, you know what? Because I was playing video games instead of learning piano, now I can make music with a computer. <laughs> <laughs> And are you still producing music? Or? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm still, I don't do it so often. Yeah. I'm still doing work for film and video. Ah, okay. I do some remixes uh, from time to time okay. for uh, friend bands and so. Um, but I got a group box recently, so maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe soon I start again. Okay. Um, Because um, maybe it has to do with this, how everything changes, you know, something that is not so new anymore. And yeah. Playing with a computer got old already, you know, like, for example. Yeah, yeah. At the moment was something very... At this moment it was something very special. Yeah. Futuristic. <laughs> In a way. Uh, Crawford also changed to play only with uh, laptops. Yeah, that's right. So, but uh, as I told you, in uh, at these days in the record, I mean, it was really... It's our music, for example, there was yeah. every week coming new records from all over the world. It was really, it was, it was always a happening and hmm. um, it was an exciting time, I think. And this was compact, compact was born also. 
Yeah, Compact Mark. was uh, before, um, at this time, Compact, I think, was uh, called Delirium. Okay. Delirium was a chain store from, from Frankfurt, founded by, by Atta. Ah, right. Uh, the DJ. Um, yeah, from Robert Johnson, right? Uh, from Robert Johnson. Yeah. He owns the Robert Johnson The now. house scene. Uh, exactly, in the Paris. And he, he has this... Uh, um, uh, this Delirium brand, and he sold the brand to to Cologne, and I think to to some other cities. And then uh, they the guys from Delirium in Cologne decided to do their own thing, and they changed the name to Compact, and then they were on their own, and and they started uh, their to to build up their Imperium. They right. they they already and still have in in right. Cologne. Yeah. So yeah. And uh, what was exactly what was called the sound of Cologne? Yeah, I was part of it in a way, but the sound co of Cologne was, I think, um, when I think it was someone from the Wire magazine, maybe, or from some other UK magazine. He came to Cologne, and we had this club uh, called Liquid Sky Cologne. Liquid Sky, exactly. Yeah. This was uh, the most important place in Cologne at this time because, yeah, there were the best parties, the best DJ sets, um, the best bar, the best guys. This, this was the place to be. And uh, I, I remember that this guy from UK was coming to Cologne and um, he checked out Liquid Sky. And I think he spent maybe more than one night there, and uh, <laughs> and he met everyone there, and um, and I think this guy he invented this so-called topic sound of Cologne, and this included uh, Ingmar Koch from Air Liquid, but also um, Air Liquid, yeah. uh, Wolfgang Vogt, Wolfgang Vogt, who who was already well known as uh, as Mike Inc. and he started his minimal studio ones here's profound records and stuff like this. I was totally absolutely fun of that. Everyone it was specifically was what I was into. Me too, <laughs> me too. And but it was also our music. Our music was also very, very important with their releases because in a way they were um in a way to present or to to um, to handle electronic music, they were, I think, um, the guys from us, they were definitely the first, but they were more in the experimental, the abstract, when crowd rock and all these things nobody heard at this time. And um, and when they when this mixed up with electronic music, our music was also very, very important for Cologne. And I think this guy... I don't know, he checked everything, boo, 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 and he was maybe, I don't know, a little bit drunken in a club and said, yeah, this is the sound of Cologne. And then I think some, I think it was Wire magazine, but I'm not sure yet, I can't remember. <laughs> and then this getting, uh, in German you say, geflügeltes Wort. So then at this time it was Sunday, the sound of Cologne. And, um, and for me, it f and the label, because at this time I start the label, for me, it was very important because um, it open, um, yeah, it opened everything. Or everything was opened. I found a distribution very quickly because I I made a label based in Cologne and it was electronic yeah and so uh, for me it was yeah it, um, everything become or became uh, more easy to 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 start uh, mm. to start a, a record label and um, but it's based on on the work of Air Liquid, mm -hmm. Wolfgang Vogt, Mike Inc. and our music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the moment, the music you were choosing to release or that you started to choose to release, you you didn't have. A certainty that this will work anywhere else in a way. I have, I, had, I can imagine. I had no because idea because it sounded like nothing that was. I had no own. idea. I had no idea. <laughs> the the game changer was uh, because um, I think uh, I, in the beginning I did uh, these twelve inches only. Ninety seven was the first karaoke. Ninety ninety seven exactly. And uh, in the beginning, I released uh, 12 inches only, and I think there was one CD from, from uh, Zenking. And uh, everything went pretty well. That means um, um, I think every release was break even in a way. I've got some money, and I had some money to produce the next record. 
But then in 1998, I released uh, the, the record from Jörg Follert called Wunder. And this changed everything because uh, we sold it a lot. <laughs> So we really, we, we, we suddenly... The, vi the vinyl format? The version. vinyl and the CD, everything, both formats. And because there was no digital format, is this, is this days? Right, we no. have to explain to the yeah. younger, Okay, uh, it was in uh, 1998. Yes, that CDs were these round things that you exactly, would sell exactly. in a plastic box you, that will always break. And <laughs> you can produce it very cheap and you can sold, uh, sell it very expensive. And, right. Uh, so, but Wunder, uh, Wunder changed everything because uh, with this release uh, I realized wow I can I can live from that so so we, we make a lot of money and um, not in one moment hmm. but uh, yes yeah, there was suddenly money I don't have to make a second job or uh, this was suddenly it was only the label perfect and was the golden ticket yeah it was I mean but the record is brilliant uh, and yeah. it was unique at this time mm -hmm. and until today I, w I would say I don't know it's mm -hmm. just my opinion it's a real classic it's this um, yeah. it made me think about what you say about recognizing the Beatles <laughs> essence of the music like is it something you aim for when you like something that would uh, endure and last and um Changes, let's say, of paradigms and music and so. No, no, but it's have nothing to do with the Beatles. The Beatles are, pff, way. but <laughs> but but Jörg Follert, who produced this record, I think uh, what he did is that he he was really into sampling. Yeah. And uh, he used samples and uh, arranged it uh, with his uh, with his own um, way to make music, and I would say at this time it was. Nobody did this before, and um, and the record is um, it's, it's very sad. Micro sampling, you mean? Maybe. No, it's not micro sampling. Oh. It is. Uh, he he used really um, well known well known ah, music okay. and like mashup. Uh, no, not mashup. No, no. It is. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm still afraid to talk him up because uh, I, I'm still afraid to be uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be catched because because also uh, no he he really um, York he, he is a music addicted guy he he really loves music and uh, different styles and uh, so he 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 take he he took part of uh, for example. Um, Billy Holiday, right? And he sampled it, and he um, arranged. This comes maybe more from hip hop tradition, no? Yeah, hip but it, but it, yeah, it, yeah, but uh, he, it, he was able to do it because he ha he owed uh, the Kurzweil 2000. Uh, he, this was a this was a, a sampler and okay. a keyboard in a, in a ah. It's a great machine. It's just fantastic, yes. and he bought it at this time, and so he can he can do the sampling thing. On the one hand, and on the other hand, he was able to 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 um, to arrange his own music around the sample. And um, I don't know what he did, but uh, <laughs> he did great. And uh, and I, I would say until today, it's um, sometimes I'm a little bit annoyed. For example, when 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 people sing, uh, I, I met people I don't know, and say, Ah, you you are doing karaoke kalk and Ah, wonder. Ah, yeah, wonder. I remember wonder. Oh, and, it's the same one. And this is no, no. And wonder is uh, 15, 20, 20, 20, 22 years ago. I understand, and, yeah. and and everything is always coming back to this record. But I have to say, uh, it is. Yeah, I think it's an important record, or okay. the most important record on the on the label. But as I told you, for me, were different. Uh, stage of records from the label. Yeah, Le Rock, like for example. Like the Meat Meets Map Station, Le Rock, To Rock O Yeah. Um, all day long, you know. To Rock O Road was uh, not not really on Kaoka Culture. I think To Rock O Road they released on City, no, it's not City's name. There was Payola, a different label, but mm -hmm. uh, Stefan Schneider from yeah. Toroko Korot, he's map station. Right. And he did the collaboration with Kuchen. Good and Kuchen. and Kuchen is, uh, she is an artist from UK, Meryl Barham. 
And um, she has also. Um, she was playing at Pale Saints. A solo. She has also a solo. Oh, she, she had also a, a solo album as Kuchen. Exactly, and she, yeah, and for for her, it's it's it was also a completely new experience it's because she was also coming from a band background, and uh, she she start uh, started um, to do her own thing, and um, yeah, and and the, the records are brilliant. And the funny thing is that um, this record, I don't know. Really, I think Kuchen maps uh, Kuchen was released in 1999 or 2000, and then there was nothing happened. But since I would say six months, seven months, maybe one year, people are interested again in this record. People start buying this record. It's unbelievable. So I realized when 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 I got the order from my web shop or mm. from from Bandcamp or whatever, so mm. that uh, people starting ordering the really old stuff because mm. they discover it again or they remember that or yeah because it's so long time ago <laughs> so. right and even though i started in a, a further stage of the label and so and i have to say at the time i didn't uh, put all this uh, music together re in relation to the label uh, I learned this uh, afterwards, in a way, mm -hmm. especially with friends like Dilo, who is a music nerd, and so I know <laughs> was one of the ones who was just putting me, uh, music in my computer. Yeah, you, yeah. Know, and you have to listen to this. <laughs> but uh, I definitely felt that this was something uh, uh, that I really uh, feel near as my music. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I have to admit, I have also the fascination in a way that since I never made. Uh, uh, traditional um, music uh, studies, these uh, melodical arrangements, all this music that is behind it, of course, it's something I could I could not do. Also, you know, so, but it was definitely something new and something fresh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, even for someone that wasn't following either the tradition of rock or yeah. the tradition of electronic music. Yeah, you know? yeah. Someone external could just jump in with this and, and start liking music in general. Yeah, yeah. But I, I have also, to, because I think the label was never in the foreground. I think the label was, from the beginning, it was always... Um, determined by the artists, because the artists had he can choose the artwork, he can, the music, we, of course we discuss the music, whatever, but I think the artists on the label are more well known as the label itself, so, which is totally fine, and um, I never had a kind of trademark for for, for, for the label, In, for example, that uh, I have a completely... Um, yeah, that I already know how the artwork should look like or whatever. So it was for me. It was always important that the artist uh, can decide how his record should look like. I don't. I don't. For me, it was, I, I, I don't read care. The, the, you said in an interview, or they asked you that um, somehow the cover, the cover of the albums would stay, but not the image of the label. And exactly. you answer something like this, that it has to do with this. Uh, Absolutely. Sort of so, but because on the other side, I mean, this is, uh, um, for example, when you, when you watch all the different cover artworks over 25 years now, so um, every artwork looks different to each other and every and this is what I really like is this because it, it's also it's the music is also different so there's um, I do not release electronic music only I do not release independent music only I do not release weird music from Japan only everything is possible you know and every you can I can release whatever I like <laughs> and yeah. this is kind of a Hallelujah. <laughs> this is, yeah. And this is pretty good. A lot of planets align, I think, at this time, like culturally, historically, yeah. market-wise, you know, because market also music changed very fast afterwards. Yeah, market-wise, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it got back very quickly, you know, uh, after that, in a way, talking about selling CDs and so. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to be honest, I don't produce CDs anymore at the right. moment. I, I produce <laughs> vinyl and cassettes. 
<laughs> they are producing cassettes also. My RT friends yeah. also release only in cassettes. Yeah, I, I, for the first time uh, we have a cassette release right now. It's it's already in production and. Uh, But for me, I'm, I, it, it's, you know, the artist, it was the artist's wish. He said, so, oh, come on, let's, let's make a cassette. I have to so, accept as an object is very, very nice, very but, beautiful. But even for, yeah, but even from my, um, when I remember cassettes, <laughs> I remember it was always connected with trouble. <laughs> it sounds bad. Rewind and it. You rewind <laughs> it. And oh, you have this uh, in German called Bandsalat. It, it's <laughs> getting Bandsalat. Fiber, And then you I have understand. to tape it in a way. And uh, it was always connected with trouble and stress. And, um, and even yeah. the sound wasn't very good. So hmm. um, I'm really surprised that this format is getting popular again. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. <laughs> I thought maybe mini disc. If, if there's a mini, I was totally into mini disc. I don't know why they stopped. I don't if understand. there's a mini disc comeback, I'm in. So the I cassette, would, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> This uh, Sony mini disc player, I can't <laughs> check it for. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, uh, much better. Talking about obsolete, obsolete uh, format. <laughs> obsolete media. You know the yeah. book? <laughs> no, I, uh, it rings a bell. There's, there's a book called, uh, uh, what is the name again? Home for Obsolete Media. It's fantastic. It's, it's from a guy called name. Flo Kaufmann. He's okay. from Switzerland. And it's a book all about this uh, huge technical in, in, in Erfindung, in, in inventions, yeah. like, like mini disc and, and, and <coughs> Walkmans and everything. And you see that everything is going to the trash because something new was coming up. But it doesn't mean that the old technique was bad. It was it was really good technique. And uh, most of cases it has nothing to do with the functionality or sustainability of the format itself. This yeah. is what consumerist capitalism is in a way. This is it right. makes very beautiful things like TV. <laughs> uh, That was developed, was developed in Germany, actually. It's kind of like a Nazi uh, invention, product of this uh, technocratic... Yeah. You know, but it's beautiful. And yeah. these are things, technological things, that maybe we would never done, you know, yeah, yeah. otherwise. Yeah. And um, I think the, well, this kind of new music that we are talking about, um, as we were saying, as post-punk post and so... It has to do a lot with making these things that maybe have a horrible origin, <laughs> like in war development sure. or so, you know, or the sounds are sound out of this world or too harsh, or like a robot that wakes you up at night. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and um, so, um, uh, subverting this, incorporating this, integrating this into a new composition, yeah. you know, uh, as something that is beautiful in the whole. Um, I definitely uh, think that a lot of a lot of those um, influences coexist in this um, new music. Um, and talking about uh, weird Japan music, like you said before, weird yeah. Japan music, Mikiyaju Ensemble. <laughs> It's a band from Japan from the 1980s from the beginning of the 1980s. And in this interview, I think you were listening to this at the time, and this is why you mentioned it. Uh, or maybe they lied in the interview, I don't know. But um, since you said uh, we are a Japan music, it made me remind, remind me of this. And when I listened to this uh, band, um, also the references was like, it was between minimal and new music. Uh, it makes me think about how uh, the music we are talking about now, uh, at least at first, it also had this, no, between minimal and new music. Because new music is a term that was used for electroacoustic music, sure. you know, for experimental music, sure. for very, um, uh, like, uh, unaffected, disaffected, And glitch only made by audio engineers, you know. I, I wouldn't say that uh, the, the music I released on, on, on the label Kao Kakai, it wasn't new music. It was kind, uh, we, we called it, uh, at these days, it's, it's, there was a name called Electronica. 
Electronica. So, Electronica. It was too broad, I think. So this was, this was bringing everything under one roof. Okay. Electronica. Yeah. So, and, um, yeah. And so what you would call chill out music or... Oh, no. <laughs> At the time, they would call it that. Yeah, the, the guys from the techno room said this is chill out <laughs> chill music. Out. <laughs> <laughs> but but we we said it's uh, it's it's electronica and this electronica changed uh, a little bit later to so called indie tronica. Right. This is when 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 the people who already released electronica music reminds that huh, I was playing in bands before. Maybe I can play in a band now again and mix it up with my own bedroom stuff and then uh, and the laptop is my drum exactly my so and uh, so so this uh, i think i think these are the, the right terms to describe the music as these days it was electronica electronica blah 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 hmm. today everything is completely mixed up so nobody knows exactly how, how to what what kind of music uh yeah this is where i wanted to go the concept of the new you know like yeah. at this time even though we were already post you know we, we at the beginning of the 2000s for example we were already post a lot of cycles in music but still there was this feeling of understanding something completely new something completely yeah. fresh that was yeah. piercing yeah. through you know yeah, yeah. And um, I don't know if it's a generational thing, but to me nowadays everything seems to be more diffuse, you know? I think at the moment it is uh, the... Um, um, in my opinion, at the moment, um, it's really hard to find really kind of new music. Uh, I, I discover new music when, um, when I listen to the music to my daughter. Uh, the, the music, the, my daughter, That's she's 23 years old now. And uh, sometimes uh, she, sh she shows me stuff. I was like, what the hell is this? So, and... Um, you have no system references for it's, it's, understanding. It's, it's, it's <laughs> really like, so, wow. And, and some of the stuff I really like. And, but, but on the other hand, I think at the moment we are really in a kind of a... Um, uh, it's not. I, I wouldn't call it revival, but but you realize that um, f there's a huge um, amount of repress. That means people discover music which is 20, 20 years, twenty five years old, maybe older. Hmm. So people discover at the moment more the music from the past. And then they, they release it new. For example, uh, uh, I didn't talk, but I, I, I'm working in the mastering studio. We, we, have, yeah. some, we have some clients uh, who, uh, who released uh, music from the 80s. Man-made mastering. Man-made mastering. And, um, and uh, at the moment, I think we are more in this kind of uh, revival thing in a way that people looking for this music, they want to have it on vinyl. And uh, there's a huge scene, or, or, but not scene, but it doesn't matter. Because, for example, when you go through the record shops in Berlin, you find shops who are really focused on represses. They have repress from Dire Straits, Love Over Gold, um, gatefold cover now, digital remaster, blah blah blah, and and there's tons of the shit. And um, but there's also a huge revival for disco music, for Italo disco, for example. And so um, I think at the moment we are more in the past than in the future, musical wise. So right, because it's like all this, the the different decades styles and generations coexist at the same level of accessibility at yeah. least i watched this joke on a simpsons episode they're still <laughs> on the simpsons by the yeah. way <laughs> when in, in a recent episode they make a joke about how all the kids in the school in the primary school because of spotify then they have individual kind of um uh, hypes. Yeah. It's uh, one is into like a new wave, England, whatever, and the other one is into um, pop music from. And uh, this happens also. It's everything is typified in a bit. Uh, totally. But I wonder what happens next. You know. 
Because if now we are at this stage, then what is the next When step? I would know this, I would get rich. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I don't have any idea. So it is, um, I don't know what's next. I mean, I think, I mean, um, per music is all, always also a very personal thing, you know. And um, it is like... Uh, you discover the music you want to discover. And um, so, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I know, for example, yeah, for sure, Spotify is very popular, especially for the young kids, and for, but even for me. And, for um, me <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, people are looking for vinyl records. They, they still want to have right. uh, the, the haptic thing. And, <laughs> exactly. and, and uh, there are so many music out there Uh, which is uh, until today very unknown and not very popular, and people discover this music from this time, and and they 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 try to organize the master the masters to 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 make a repress mm. of, of this. And um, but um, in my opinion, what what the what the common the current music, uh, it's hard to say. It's a, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a moment. I don't know. I, I grew up with techno music. I grew up right. with, with house music. I was, I don't know, in 1992, 1991, I, I went to this party. This was really new for me. Mm. It was new. And um, and I would say since then, I, I didn't discover anything similar to this. So Because this was changing a lot. And mm. um, But this doesn't mean that the music now is not interesting because maybe I don't understand right. it. <laughs> so it's I, uh, someone retweeted, I think, uh, Chef Mills or Josh Wink a tweet that said that there are proof that techno is in a way immortal. You know, there is a classical thing, like a pure kind of thing that will... It might be, I don't know. It's hard to find something it's so new much there. elements, you know. Yeah, but it's hard to find something new in techno music. But right. but what we can say or what we I try though. But, but, I try to find something. Yeah, me too. But 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 what we know and this is a good thing with with, with techno or with house music or with electronic music or with it's that it still works. I mean you can still make people dance and, and you can still make having people a good time and that they still enjoy and uh, and forget themselves and still just have a good time for, for one night, whatever. Yeah. So, And this is what it still exists. There's a commercial thing, for sure. We don't want to know. But there's still, I think, a very living underground scene who keeps this, I don't know, maybe this, this formal vibe still mm. alive. Uh, mm -hmm. which is already, I don't know, 40, no, yeah, maybe 30 years old, <laughs> maybe yeah. older. So, but, yeah. yeah, I don't know. What you said about the purpose of making you dance, um, there's this uh, music historian, uh, Simon Reynolds. He makes this, like, academic-wise, he's one of the responsible of officially making this link and including electronic music in the history of yeah. music, right? And he has some very nice uh, quotes on electronic music, and there's one that says that um, electronic music has the possibility of uh, making your body think and your brain dance. That's right. And when I read this, I thought about these special moments uh, yeah. we had with my friends listening to karaoke called uh, <laughs> albums after the party <laughs> in the early 2000s. I understood something there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I still believe in that. Yeah. Uh, either way. Yeah. I admit that uh, I don't um, research for music or to collect music. In a way, I was never a DJ. Yeah. <laughs> But I had this time of uh, I don't do it anymore. And I regret also not to have follow up so closely the label because I realized, wow, so much amazing records came one after the other, you know. And, and there's so much music out. I mean, yeah. so, and for sure. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to follow. I mean, this is what I did also. I mean, I remember that that uh, I had some labels um, I, I really adore. 
and I bought everything. I bought everything, <laughs> and I need everything. And I, I, I was not just listening to the. Way. I just bought it because <laughs> I needed it. And but but this is a little bit over also. Yeah. So and um, and and I think even the 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 meaning of having a label is today super different it's shifted yeah. yeah because for example uh, when you, when you're using spotify everything is focused on the artists and the music you, you don't know the label the, the label is not mentioned right. there you know and and this is good in one way and for me it, it doesn't make any difference because no. uh, for me the label never was in the foreground it was it, it wasn't so it was always the artists and music and and personally, I'm 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 still happy uh, that that the label still exists. I mean, it's 25 years right. now. We are talking about the early 2000s, but the, the label kept releasing one yeah, after other exactly. of amazing music. And always, I have to say, true to this um, origin in a way. And and there were all, 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 always also some artists, for example, I don't know Hauschka. Who was getting very famous, yeah. uh, and uh, it's not because of the label Karo Kakai, but he comes from electroacoustic music. No, no, ah. no, 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 no. Hauska was because uh, he was master of prepared pianos. Yeah, but he was uh, he was in a pop band before. Okay, and then uh, he it's the same thing. He he was bored of it, and then he, because he was uh, he, he's a piano player, and then right. he starts a piano thing. And uh, the first two records uh, I released on Kao Kakalk and and the hell what nobody was interested in. <laughs> <laughs> nobody takes care about it. So, but I have to say that Volker was uh, he he he's the best. I mean he was really convinced of his music and he so and one year after the other, his music became more and more popular. But he changed completely his musical topic. He was really into the piano me 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 so. <laughs> and I'm I'm very happy that that I released this records and, mm. and also I discovered some some new stuff which was also, in a way, a kind of a commercial success. And um, but I have to say that this never was the the aim of the label. I released um, people sending me the music. I listen to the music, and when I like it, I release it. When it's not successful, I don't care. So mm. because I was happy when I released on my that's it. But I have to say, these days, I'm getting more and more careful <laughs> because <laughs> it's it's pretty hard running a, a record label, and you have to think more than twice if you want to release them because of it's a lot of work also. Of course, but you can definitely tell that this uh, approach, hardly approach that you took, really uh, paid out because it resulted in a continuum of a very good. Uh, inspirational music. No, so. for me it's like it's it's still because I, I I met or I meet still meet people who are super talented musicians and um, I'm really happy to collaborate with them. I'm really happy that they that they trust the label that that I can do something for them and um, I'm really happy to release their music on my label and. Um, the, the the commercial effect is it's not so it's important in a way but not so important and um, but um, I'm I'm really happy that I I can still do what I want to do since 25 years <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah that's important to be grateful about uh, totally and it's not it's not my you know it's not my um, I I'm only the logistic guy I mean it's the artist. Who Some call it the brain behind it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the artists who produce the music and uh, who who put all the efforts mm. in. And um, mm. I'm I'm just simple doing <laughs> the the organization around. So you're too modest. I think. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's okay. <laughs> and if you have to bet, even though we don't know where it's going, yeah. If you got to bet, yeah. I know you always put your heart into this, but everything changed many times. Uh, across oh, you, along your career, if uh, you had to bet, what's the next change? The next what, change. What would you? Uh, in in a music way, or in in, yeah. in, in uh, running a we label. Can, we or? can talk uh, more uh, general if you want. Oh, well, I don't know. To be uh, I'm, I, a vision for the future. A vision for the future. It's called this, I don't this know. segment. 
Okay. I think I, I can only tell my personal opinion. It's just like, you know, I'm I'm an old school guy. And, uh, for example, I still like the vinyl format. I still yeah. like uh, releasing music uh, from 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 talented artists, from talented musicians and from talented people. And I know that um, it's getting more and more difficult to do this and uh, for the artists as well as for the label. And um, But I also realized that um, after so many years, um, I'm uh, flexible, you know, because... For example, when when the, there was a time for the label, it was between I think 2000 and 2004. It it was um, going very well. It was really like it was like you go to Zona Barcelona, you get a call from your distribution. Hey, we need more. You have to make a repress. We need more right. uh, more copies. Blah blah blah. So. I was kind of and of said, yeah, no problem. I organized it. So and so we we were selling, we were selling music, and we 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 make money with it. So right, and then uh, there was coming the MP3, <laughs> the yes. download. So yeah. you know, and this was the first like so. Oh God, this is harsh because no one was. Uh, it was even put, less quality than a CD at the time. Yeah, the, and the, the nobody kilobyte. was uh, nobody was prepared for it and. Nobody can handle this business at this time, and the, the sales were going down, and everything was a mess. So, and since then, um, I, in my opinion, I would say everything was very became very difficult. And until today, it is every sometimes every week it's like uh, another bad message, like so. Okay, oh gosh, but you can handle this. Mm. And um, in a way, I think. Um, at the moment, for example, now we have the vinyl crisis. We've had the vinyl crisis for a long time already. No, no, no we have the vinyl crisis uh, in a way that uh, the format vinyl is super popular. I, because vinyl was dead. It was fucking dead. So, yeah. and, and now, uh, so since a couple of years, it's getting more and more popular because it's the only format, the haptic format, which can exist next to digital, next to streams. And, um, but now we have the situation that uh, when, because I release vinyl all the time, and usually I, you know, uh, you master a record, uh, the master is approved, you make uh, uh, the vinyl cut, you got the test pressing, you mm -hmm. approve the test pressing, you get the finished copy, it was maybe three months. And now it's 12, because everyone wants to release a vinyl record. This is, it's unbelievable. And there's also the, um, uh, there's a less of paper because of the uh, pandi pandemic situation. The, the, the Rohstoff, what's Rohstoff in English? Material. The material. So the, it's, 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 it's really hard for the pressing plants to get the material. Okay. So the industry is pressing all their shit. So they, they blocked the, the plants. And now it's really difficult to release a vinyl record. I, because I, I already ordered a vinyl record and I have to wait until February 2023. And I said, what? So you have to wait for one year. Luckily, I still hold on to mine. What I want to say is, I don't want to complain, but yeah. what I want to, want to say is, uh, you're always uh, standing in front of new problems, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So this is what I mean with you have to be flexible. But this is what, in the beginning, I hated. But <laughs> now I, I start to, to like it because uh, this is the reason why I start working mm. with the social network things, and yeah. Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, and all the things. So I, I mean, I really hate it in the beginning, but to be honest, it's more, it's, it's it's getting more and more fun because you can make your little your little films, your little clips, and you post it and 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 and, yeah. and so, and th this is also kind of of our new reality. I resisted you know? it for so long, and I Me kind too. of was convinced that because I was right in my analysis, but that didn't mean didn't mean that 
the form of communication of the whole world had already changed. You yeah. know? So when all in exchange systems change already, yeah. you still want to be inside of society and culture, you know, so you better find the good side of it <laughs> because otherwise exactly. it's like you're completely out. I, I, as I said, you can go back to your... Um, I don't know to your to your hula and yeah, uh, and to your call. <laughs> no no the point is that uh, I mean I start in a way I start like to do the things I also know that I would never sell one more copy because of being I don't know part of the social network thing and uh, doing my Instagram movies whatever so but uh, I realize it's fun It's, it's, it's at the end it's fun to do this and so now we always have to handle uh, with new situations and um, and you can can complain about this and you can be sad about this but uh, at the end if you want to to bring this to an end in a way and I think I'm I'm not finished then you have to handle with this so yeah I like it. It's a um, <laughs> it's a, a final message. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Thorsten, for being here. Thank you very much for for having me here. So. Um, if you want to find out about uh, Thorsten's uh, labels and projects, we will leave some links in the description. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to give us a like and a comment under the video. If you want to see more, click here and don't forget to subscribe to the channel.